Hey everyone and welcome back to this class, Advanced Computer Vision. In this new section of the course, we are going to talk about class activation maps. Now that name is probably meaningless to you, so let's discuss what we're actually trying to do in terms of things we already know about. I think the idea behind class activation maps is best summarized in the picture you see here, which is exactly the kind of picture we're going to learn how to produce. So what's going on here? Well, we can see that we've overlaid a sort of heat map over the original image, and we can see that the area around the main object that is being identified is hotter than the rest. So in some sense, we've done object localization. We've figured out where the object is in the image, and not just what the object is, which is what classification would tell us. And what I'm going to show you in this lecture is quite surprising because you'll see that in order to make a picture like this, we don't have to do any task other than just plain classification. So let's dig into the details. As I mentioned, the only thing we have to do is classification. So we can take any pre-trained image classification network, such as ResNet, and we already have everything we need. The key point is thinking about what happens to an image as it travels through the neural network. We've discussed this many times before, but it's worth going through one more time in this context. As an image passes through a CNN, it shrinks. Or more accurately, the image dimensions shrink, but the number of features increases. And we can also imagine that we're using a ReLU activation function, so all the values are either positive or zero. After the final convolution block, we can imagine what happens is a global max or average pooling, so that you only have one value per feature, and then we pass each feature through a logistic regression to predict the output label. So intuitively, we can think of each feature as an actual thing in the image. For example, if you were to recognize a face, you might have a feature for eyes, a feature for nose, a feature for ears, lips, chin, hair, and so forth. You might imagine that if you actually pass in a picture of a face, these features will all end up with positive values. But the feature for some other thing, such as a wheel, will be zero. But what happens if I pass in a picture of a car? Well, if I pass in a picture of a car, then the wheel feature will be positive and the nose feature will be zero. So that's intuition number one. Think of each feature as an actual thing that can be found in an image. Intuition number two requires us to work backwards in a CNN. Suppose we did find some feature in an image and its feature value was positive. Since we did a global max pool, that feature must have been found somewhere in the image. And before we did the max pool, we would have known the location of that feature. So if we imagine what the picture looks like before doing max pool, we can imagine that it's just a bunch of zeros and some positive values indicating where in the image that feature was found. This picture is a key piece of the class activation map. Intuition number three comes from thinking about the logistic regression layer. Logistic regression is a very simple, very interpretable linear classifier. Basically, if a weight is positive, that means that feature is positively correlated with this class. If a weight is zero, that means that feature doesn't have any predictive ability for this class. And if a weight is negative, that means seeing this feature makes it less likely that this picture belongs to this class. And of course, this all assumes that all the feature values are greater than zero. All right, so to build a class activation map, we just have to combine these intuitions. Suppose we're looking at ResNet, which gives us 2048 features after the final max pool. We therefore have 2048 weights for each of the 1000 output classes. Let's take a moment to look at the model summary of ResNet so we can be sure about this. So we can see here the size of the data picture after the last few operations. First, we can see that before the max pool, we have a 7x7x2048 image. 
that means we have a 7x7 seven seven image, or you can think of that as 2048 separate 7x7 seven seven images. Then, this is squashed down by taking the average pool, so we get a vector of size 2048. Then we multiply this by a weight matrix of size 2048 by 1000, which gives us an output prediction for each of the 1000 classes. Importantly, we only consider one class at a time when we build a class activation map, usually for the predicted class. So for example, if we predict human face, then we would grab the column of weights that correspond to the class human face. Now just before we do the max pool, we have a 7x7 image, and there are 2048 individual images. So all we have to do is weight the importance of each image by multiplying them by the logistic regression weights. If you're very observant, you will notice that this is just a dot product, or in other words, a weighted sum of images. Now what we get out of this is a single 7x7 image. So what do we do with this 7x7 image? Well, in order to overlay this image on the original, they have to be the same size. So we can use SciPy, for example, to upsample the image so that it's the same size as the original and then overlay the two images together. And that's how you draw a class activation map. So why is this important? Well, we looked at the idea of object localization in this course, where we try to draw a box around the object that the classifier has identified. But you can see that with this technique, we don't even need to draw such a box. Simply by training a classifier as you normally would, you automatically know where the object is. Of course, this may also depend on you correctly identifying the object.